and she glowed. So this glowing thing is getting real popular. And so anyway, they had all these different encounters with her, and this was getting very famous because this was a very devout part of where people were really into the Catholic Church. And at one point, all these people had gathered to see the lady, quote unquote. That's what she called herself, the lady. And it was raining cats and dogs, and they all had umbrellas. It was miserable. You know, they were all like, I forget how many thousand people standing there in the rain. And these three little kids were praying. None of them were more than 12 years old. And all of a sudden, the sky parts miraculously. And you see the sun. But then all of a sudden, the sun starts moving. And it starts going like this and going like this and dipping and barreling, rolling and doing all these strange things. And of course, the people were totally freaked. Because then again, thousands of people saw this. But nobody else saw it. I mean, the people up in Paris didn't see it. The people in London didn't see it. So obviously it wasn't the sun. Now again, looking at that from our perspective as a space age, technologically oriented society, we would say, oh, that was a UFO. And maybe that lady that came down was a Nordic goddess from the planet Tralfamador. And she was here to help us get past our next stage of human evolution. So I said all of that because some of the things I'm about to tell you about my particular experiences, you know, they could be taken either way. So I keep an open mind. We need to exec objectively examine Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. That should be Genesis 6. I'm sorry, that's a typo. 6, 1 to 5. These are obviously B'nai Elohim. There's no question about that. Let's read the passage. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, notice that's important. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, and the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay. Now it's very clear that they married the daughters of men, quote unquote. And they fathered children which were either giants, and the Hebrew word there is Nephilim, or mighty men, men of renown. Now because of that, we had some awful things happen. The earth became so horribly wicked. This has never really happened in the history of the world before or since. Things were so bad that he had to destroy virtually all life on the planet. And we all know the story except for Noah and his family and, of course, the animals that he took on the ark. Everything else was wiped out in this catastrophic flood. So whatever was happening there must have been really awful. I mean, a lot worse even maybe than what's happening, you know, in this century. There's two theories about the sin. One is that the B'nai Elohim were the godly line of Seth, quote unquote. This is a standard theological line you'll get in most seminaries. Uh, and the daughters of men were simply children of wicked Cainites. In other words, descendants of Cain. There's some problems with this. The first problem is that there's scant scriptural support. What I mean by that is nowhere in the Old Testament is the phrase, B'nai Elohim, sons of God, used of human beings. For example, I, you know, I don't have time to read them, but if you go to Job 1.6, I'll read this one. Now there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now obviously this is up in the heavenly court, so these are not men. Also, Job 2.1, Job 38.5 and 7, all of those passages are clearly referring to celestial beings. Now there are some passages in the New Testament. For example, Romans 8.14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And there are other passages. But notice, all of this is after Calvary. All of this is after the cross. Before that, nobody could be adopted, as it were, into the family of Yahweh. After the cross, that could happen. We could literally become 
sons of God. But there were no sons of God in the Old Testament except angels. Since the new birth prophesied in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, but not present, we can indeed become sons and daughters of Elohim. Thus, from the standpoint of scriptures, it is unlikely that these B'nai Elohim were simply godly men. The other thing about this is, history provides many examples of godly men marrying nasty women, but they didn't have giant kids, did they? I mean, I'm sure probably a lot of you know people that are, you know, good men, but they made a mistake and married some, you know, trollop of a woman or something or some unbeliever or whatever. And they had perfectly normal kids. You know, they didn't have like giants or people like, you know, Superman or something. So, you know, even historically that doesn't hold water. Then thirdly, there's little evidence for a godly line of Seth, quote unquote, in the Bible. This makes it sound like, like the descendants of Seth where you should forgive the expression perfect little angels. And actually they weren't. In fact, if you look at it, the, the immediate son of Seth was kind of a doofus, you know. And beyond that, none of these people, if, if the godly line of Seth was so godly, why do we have the flood? You know, why did Yahweh have to wipe out probably everything on earth? So this, this whole thing, it may be politically correct, but it doesn't hold water. The second theory is that daughters of men were just that, human women, and the B'nai Elohim were actually celestial beings, fallen angels. This is the common use in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and it also makes sense in the light of the extraordinary offspring that they were having. Now, the other thing we want to look at is Paul's mysterious warning in 1 Corinthians 11. There he says that women should cover their heads, quote-unquote, because of the angels. Now, what does that mean? And I would submit to you that what it means is this. Is it just as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of David, as it is back in the days of Paul and it is today, Angels can be tempted by the beauty of human women. Even as much as they are in the presence of Yahweh and all of the benefits that that would have, they can be tempted into falling into sin. And that to have a covering protects the women from the predation of these angels, these fallen celestial beings. And just as a sidebar, we have found a very interesting thing in our ministry is that with, with women who are having problems, like with a succubus-type spirit, an incubus-type spirit, these are sexual demons that come and prey on people when they're trying to sleep or when they're actually asleep, uh, or other kinds of manifestation of a similar nature, even people who are being victimized by what seems to be alien abduction. And these are believers now. These are Christian women. Is what we did is we thought, well, gee, maybe we should just, duh, follow the Bible's advice. We told them to wear a head covering to sleep. And you know what? It completely vanished. The problem completely went away. You know, if at first you don't succeed, read the directions. Amen? <laughs> so anyhow, this to me is an indication that here, even in the New Covenant, in, in the New Testament with the Corinthian church, Paul is, is giving his flock that is committed to his charge a warning that they need to be very careful to cover their heads for the sake of the angels. Because you women don't realize how appealing you are to angels. You have no idea. Then we have Yahweh's law of reproduction. We know that everything reproduces after his kind. If you have a daddy horse and a mommy horse, they get a baby horse. You can tell I don't have a lot of experience with farms. I don't know what they, a mare and a whatever, anyhow, a, a little baby horse, a cold, a foal, whatever they call it. Uh, <clears throat> so, with that in mind, what sort of offspring might come from an angel-human match? Think about it. Because it would have the qualities of humanity, but it would also have the qualities of the angelic nature. Nephilim. Nephilim. The other interesting thing is there's a lot of controversy about the word Nephilim. 
It does come from the Hebrew word, which a root of a Hebrew word, which means to 